Hey, what's up, guys? This is TJ Levin. You're listening to the Expansion Project with my friend Fat Tony. Before we start the show, I want to tell you all about my brand new company that just launched a few weeks ago. It's called BreakParallel.com. This website is pretty much a one-stop shop for all your functional fitness entertainment. If you're looking for videos of your favorite athletes or from your favorite companies, we have you covered. If you're looking for photos of random inspiration for your fitness or just hot fitness chicks, we've got you covered there too. Or if you just want to keep up with all the latest and greatest news that's going on in the functional fitness community, we have you covered there as well. So please book more breakparallel.com check it out every day for all the latest updates Welcome to the Expansion Project Podcast. I am your host, Fat Tony, and on this show, I have casual yet deep conversations with professional athletes, entrepreneurs, coaches, authors, bloggers, musicians, and anybody else that I find to be either interesting or successful. And my hope is that I will expand my mind and yours while motivating and inspiring people along the way. My guest today is Luke Swab. Luke is a BMX rider from Michigan that I randomly met at a skate park a few years ago, and he has a very fascinating story. He works five weeks out of the year as a fisherman in Alaska and then spends the rest of the year traveling the world on crazy adventures like driving a motorcycle from the southernmost tip of Africa to the northernmost part in Europe. He also invests in real estate to help secure his current lifestyle and prepare him for the future as well. Before I start the interview here, I want to say thank you guys for telling a friend about the show. Uh, if you've listened to the show before, you know this already, but I will say it again. You guys are the only marketing and promotion I have. So when you tell a friend and share the show on your social networks, that's how we get more listeners. So thank you guys for continuing to do that. Also, thanks to everybody who has gone over to iTunes and clicked five stars and left a review. And if you guys want to leave a review, I will read them on the show here and give you a shout out. So please head over to iTunes, click five stars, and leave a review. Also, please click on the expansionprojectpodcast.com and look over to the right side of the page. I've got a few affiliate links over there, and when you click and buy things through those links, it'll kick back some money to the show. Now, welcome my guest. Luke, thank you for making the time for me today. Yeah, how you doing? It's good to uh, finally um, sit down and have a little interview. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So to fill in everybody listening today, um, this is a pretty interesting interview for myself. Um, I've known Luke for a couple years now, but not real well. Like we kind of connected one time. I'll tell that story in just a minute. But the interesting thing about this particular interview is that I did absolutely zero preparation. I didn't even know I was going to jump on Skype with him until about six minutes ago. Um, so we're going to freeform it, and hopefully it turns out very interesting for you guys, uh, which I don't think will be too hard because I know Luke is a super interesting guy. Um, so before we start uh, chit-chatting here, I want to tell my quick little story of how Luke and I got connected and my kind of first uh, memories. Um, so back in the day, this was uh, like mid-2000, like 2006, 2007, I used to go on a website called BMX Board, which was a, a forum board. And I seem to remember this name popping up on the forum board, uh, Luke Swab. And I don't remember why I remember the name, maybe just because it sounded like a cool name or something. But I feel like I remember seeing that name, and I never knew who it was. And then many years later, this would have been, I guess, like two Decembers ago, I was uh, in Indiana um, filming a couple of BMX videos and ended up traveling to, uh, must have been somewhere Detroit-ish, somewhere in Michigan, um, for a little competition, uh, a BMX contest. And Luke was there, and we, we started making small talk, and I heard them say his name over the, the announcements or whatever. And I was like, oh, that's that guy that I used to you know, see his name on BMX board. So we started talking, and I'll be honest with you, at the time, I was like kind of getting to a point in the BMX industry where I was a little bit burnt out, and I wasn't like super, super excited to be there that day, to be honest with you. And I remember thinking like, man, I'm not good at small talk. I don't really like just like mindless chit chat with people. Um, and I wasn't like super excited to have a conversation, but somehow, I don't know how it happened, but we started talking about real estate together and that's when I perked up and I was like, oh, this dude's like more than just a BMX rider and there's actually a substance to talk about with this dude. And then I actually became very excited and, uh, and really enjoyed the conversation and stuff. Um, so during that conversation, I learned a few things about Luke and uh, one of them was that he actually owned his own boat. So if you guys know the, the TV show uh, Deadliest Catch, 
Uh, he basically told me that he did that. And then, you know, after most of the months out of the year, he just did his real estate thing and then traveled. Uh, so, of course, I connected with him on that on a bunch of levels, minus the, uh, the fishing, of course. Um, but the, the travel and the real estate stuff we connected on. Uh, and since then, I've watched his Instagram. And it's been pretty funny because we have been to a lot of the same places and there's been times when I've been in a country and he's commenting on my post like, Oh, I've been there. I stayed at that place. And then he, he'll go somewhere and I'm like, Oh, I went there and I, I went to that place, you know? Um, so it, it's pretty cool how the, uh, the power of the internet can connect two people. And now here we are, uh, mid August, 2015, and we're sitting down to have what will no doubt be our longest, most in-depth conversation so far. And now the whole world's going to see it. <laughs> so now, now that I've rambled on for about three minutes, um, let's get into this. Uh, let's, let's hear a little bit of background about you, because I think it's really, really fascinating that you come from a place where you're a BMX rider, um, but somehow or another, you ended up not only being a fisherman in the Alaskan wild or wherever the hell you go, but actually owning your own boat. So I got to know how that started. Well, okay. So the, the Alaskan fishing thing started, <clears throat> that was when I was 18 years old. I decided to go to my grandma's house for uh, Easter. And, you know, I was talking to her, haven't seen her in a while. And she said I had a cousin, a third cousin I've never met. And he owned a fishing boat in Alaska. He just bought it. So I was 18, excited. You know, you've seen the show on TV. You want to make a lot of money. So um, I called him up, asked for a job, and he gave me a job, like, right on the phone, okay? So, 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 so cool. at this point, so you're 18, up. you're living in Michigan, and yep. you're just like, huh, I'm going to go to Alaska and, and do yeah. some fishing. This is right after high school, so I'm all, you know, excited to see the world. I went to a really small school, uh, school grew up in a small town, and I just, I just always knew there was so much out there to see. Um, I was just excited, and, and here's my first chance to go to Alaska. Not only that, get paid for it, and uh, you know, see what happens after there. Cool. So that that first, uh, what, I guess it's a winter when you go. Is that right, or is no, it I, summer? Summer. Okay. Okay. That I first summer, how'd that go? Actually. Wait. So, say that again. I just got back a week ago. Oh, cool. Cool. So yeah, you're you're 18, and you go to Alaska for your first summer, not yeah. knowing anything about the Alaskan fishing industry, I assume. Yeah, and not- I, nothing about it. You can't do Google searches on Bristol Bay fishing because there's no internet really. Um, so I just go up and we I make a um, hundred bucks. We do bad. In other words, we didn't catch a lot of fish. It was a new captain. He was my my um, cousin. Um, we did everything wrong. I'm like, I'm not doing this again. This is dumb. But he decided to give me a very substantial raise for next year because he liked my work ethic and everything and and i thought okay you know because i i saw boats doing well i knew you could do well we just did horrible and um so i went back a second year and that's that's when i made 10 grand in five weeks so okay so so the first time you're 18 you go for five whole weeks and you only make a hundred dollars Hundred bucks. Yeah. Well, I had to pay for my plane ticket, which was nine hundred, and then he and he gave me a check for a thousand. That's all I earned. Everything's based on percentages, mm-hmm. so you don't know what you're gonna um, make before until the season's over. Really. Right. Just right. Fun. Okay. So, yeah. th- so then the next summer you came out on top. You made some good money, and at this yeah, point you're exactly. thinking like, okay, this this could be profitable and stuff. So, what was right. your mindset when you saw that? Like, did you immediately think like, hey, I can turn this into a big profit and allow myself, you know, the rest of the year to not have to work? Is that or, or did that come later? That was, it was more like, okay, so I'm going to start college. I'm going to be in college for at least four years. Um, this is a good chance to make a big chunk of money and pay for school as I'm going to school. I never thought it was going to be a career yet. Um, it was just, that's, I could make enough money to pay for school so I don't have to have student loans. I was always nervous about too much debt. Mm-hmm. I know college is expensive. I'm always driving cheap cars. I, I don't want to get in debt because I'm realizing that can ruin you, you know? Right. What were you studying in school? Well, I went to school for entrepreneurship. So that was business. And then I did a little photography on the side. Okay, cool. I, I can definitely relate to that. Um, so at what point then, uh, talk, talk to me about kind of the, the summers after that. Um, you're going to college and you go back to Alaska during the summers and stuff. How did that money pick up and when did you decide to kind of go full on with it and get your own boat and everything? Well, okay, so that first year was bad. The second year, I made the $10,000 check. And when I made that check after five weeks, um, my cousin, he's really cool, and he was he showed me his check. So he made $63,000. And and I'm thinking, well, that's even better. <laughs> um, and, you know, when you're 20 or, you know, as 19 at the time, um, 
you just kind of think everything's easy, everything's black and white, everything's simple. So I went home and I started talking to my parents about this and I said, I'm going to buy a boat and now I'm going to do it because I want to make that $63,000 check, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So with that money I made, I ended up buying a boat called the Blue Swan and it was it was a wreck. It was a horrible decision. Um, I bought it and then I borrowed some money from my dad to buy the license because that's the actual, that's the actual expensive part of the operation. The license at the time cost $50,000 and you had to, there's only 1800 of them. You have to own one in order to fish. Okay. So I didn't have that money. So, um, my parents are cool, coolest people in the world. Um, for no reason they let their 20 year old son, uh, borrow 50 grand and, uh, I went for it, you know, so that was the beginning. That was going to be year three. Wow. So, so only after two summers of doing this, you decided to get your own boat. Yeah, it's pretty reckless and in hindsight, horrible idea. <laughs> um, but the stars aligned and, and the third year, that was going to make or break me, right? So I'm 50 grand in debt. I have no crew to work for me. My dad says he's going to come up and work for me um, so I can save money because he wants his money back. You know? right. So he wants me to do well. He's invested. Yeah. So, so um, long story short, uh, the boat barely ran unsafe uh, most fishermen have two guys on the back deck I only had my dad who's 50 some years old um, we're missing a major component of the boat which is called the reel so we pull everything by hand all the other boats they use hydraulics and a uh, reel to bring the net in I do it all by hand with my dad for the whole summer uh-huh. I make just enough money um, to pay my dad back so I make $50,000 I pay him back I have a boat that's paid off I have no money Business is paid for in the first year. Uh huh. So, so, so that license that you paid the fifty grand for is that an ongoing thing, or once you have it, you have it? No, I have it. Okay. After this day, and that fluctuates. That goes. Um, that follows a uh, uh, market trends like real estate. Okay. So, um, it's I bought it actually at a low price, and um, currently they're around one hundred fifty thousand is what they're worth. But oh, they wow. go up and down. If the salmon industry is good that year, it'll go up and, and down. Got it. Stuff. So you bought it for fifty thousand. But if you wanted to get out of the business right now, you could sell it to somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, I could sell to anybody. You could buy it, right. um, and it's and it's just based on what people are willing to pay for Got it. it. This Got last it. summer was a pretty, um, it was a poor season. So I at the beginning of summer they're worth one hundred and fifty, but I don't know if they are right now. Got it. Okay, cool. So then year number three, you're you're, you're yeah, excuse me, you are your own captain. You got yeah, your own boat. Exactly. Your dad's working for you, and then year number four. So year number three, you break even. Year yeah. number four is that when you actually turn a profit, hopefully. No, year number four. Okay, so now the chain of events. Uh, I must have a lot of my dad's personality because year number four is my dad says, "Oh, my son just made fifty grand in in six weeks. I have to do it." Okay, oh, so shit. my dad. Now my dad buys a boat. Um, you know, midlife crisis or whatever it is. Who knows? But he's in mid fifties. Buys a boat. Buys a license. Now he's doing it. Um, but this is where the um, my luck ran out. Okay, so I had two friends work for me. Um, Jesse Neal and John and um, everything that could go wrong went wrong um, the transmission ultimately ended the season um, bad weather uh, I didn't make very much money and then my two friends unfortunately that worked for me um, they made the hundred dollar summer you know wage like I did two years er- earlier mm-hmm. so, damn alright so I, I gotta know at some point you make a profit <laughs> when, when's it come? Yeah. year five <laughs> Wait, what is that? One, two. Well, the next year after that, whatever. Um, so I'm starting this season with this horrible boat, and um, I land on a rock at the dock and put a hole in it. So it starts to, it starts to sink, and um, I let everybody know when the tide comes back up, hey, I'm sinking, um, so you please be on your boat so I can get pulled up to the crane and, and okay, get repaired. So long story short, I get repaired. I go back out and fish. A couple days later, I hit another rock coming into the channel. I start sinking again in a different spot, and I'm putting I'm, – I don't know what I'm doing. I'm putting sweatshirts down there, stuffing the hole with whatever you can. I'm talking to the Coast Guard, and, um, and they're asking me if I'm okay, but I'm a stubborn kid, and I'm saying I am not going to abandon this vessel all dramatic like, you know, because yeah, yeah, this yeah. is – this. I'm a captain. you got to go down with the ship. That's what they tell you. Um, so anyway, the tide comes back up. I start floating again. All my bilges are running. I'm barely holding my own. 
and then it takes a couple hours to get into port, get pulled out of the water, and uh, I realize I need to look for a new boat because this is bad. Yeah. So I'm talking to um, the head of Trident Seafoods um, that kind of runs the plant up there in Naknek, Alaska, and, and he says, uh, I find a boat for sale. It's 15000 It's aluminum, so it's not going to break when it hit rocks. Um, and he says, Luke, we're not a bank, but I believe in you. And, and I'm going to give you 15 grand so you can keep fishing. I know you can catch fish. I saw you in the years before, um, but don't make this a habit. Okay. So that's what happened. That was really cool. Um, that at such a young age, a guy with such, uh, I don't know, importance in a company would, would believe in me. You know, I'm wearing a backwards hat. I got long hair. I'm wearing sweatpants, mud and grease all over my hands from trying to work on this boat, struggling. And uh, he didn't care about it. He looked past all that, and he saw that I had it in my heart to, to do it. Wow. So yeah. this is where the, the story starts to turn, I think. Um, That's exactly where it turns. We caught 150,000 pounds. Um, he was this guy, Vic. He was watching me throughout the season and, and, and looking at my delivery tickets. We were doing really, really well and then made a lot of money. And uh, that's when it started doing really well. And I started thinking about what to do with this money at that point, which was the beginning of my real estate uh, ideas. Awesome. So, so already we. I'm I'm kind of shocked a little bit because you know when I first started talking to you you were like yeah I do this fishing I make a lot of money then I get to go travel and do my real estate so I, I thought it was a little bit more uh, sunshine and rainbows in the beginning you know so to hear that you had to work through all these kind of adversities and setbacks and and you were just so resilient in in your quest to make this work you know that's already pretty pretty inspirational and motivational to people I think um, so during this time that you know this five years where you really weren't making much money if anything. What were you doing then during the off season during those you know other, you know forty nine weeks out of the year? Well, that's when I was going to college, and um, so I was working at a pizza shop part time, picking up doubles, doing whatever you can. Um, back then, I would just live cheap. You know, uh, the apartment I was living in was one hundred seventy five dollars a month per person. So oh, there's wow. three of us. Um, we were the. <laughs> now that I'm a landlord, I don't look for people how I was living at that time. It's ironic, but. So one of the apartments had free um, hot water, and for, so what we did to save some money was we turned the shower on, hot water, and just kind of steam heated our apartment just to save money. I mean, that's an extreme case, but uh, I did not want student debt, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was eating a lot of pizza, because I could get that for free at the pizza shop, um, I'm driving around my cars worth six hundred fifty dollars. Um, I'm not buying the tuition books because you don't, you can't resell them for what you get for them. And most books, when you buy them, you end up not using them anyway. So I'm cutting all the corners I can while still passing classes and still um, having fun with my friends riding BMX and and doing all that stuff. So. Yeah. So. Obviously, you had it in your head that debt was bad and that, you know, you, you could cut expenses and not get into debt and stuff. Um, was this something that your parents taught you or something that you kind of witnessed as a kid that you wanted to make sure you didn't run into? Where did that mindset come from? Yeah, that is um, 100% from my childhood growing up. So I came from a really poor family. And uh, my friends that I would hang out with had uh, more money and they, you know, you could go out to eat more if, if you were over there and then you know, Christmas and birthdays, you kind of see what other kids are getting and then you just kind of feel a little, um, sad about that. And, and I just knew I knew, okay, so money is the root of all evil. And I just, I just knew I didn't ever care about being a millionaire. I just didn't want to have to worry about money. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to have enough to do things, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't going to focus on it, but, um, I'm going to, I'm going to sacrifice now and somehow create, uh, uh this, income streams so i don't have to worry about it yeah that yeah that's great so, so yeah. uh you're saying that after your you know fifth and, and first successful year of fishing that's when you started the real estate so um what was it about real estate that that drew you in or where did you start learning about that and how did that journey start for you well so i started doing construction when i was about 17 years old and i was doing that through college on the weekends, and I'd also do that in the beginning of the summer before fishing, and then and after fishing as well in August. Um, and my dad, he's all the houses he's owned, he's fixed up himself. So he's, you know, I've worked on things with him a little bit. 
Um, so I've seen pretty much every component of how a house is put together. Mm -hmm. So I had the knowledge of what a house was, what's good, what's bad with homes. Um, and then the, and then me having to pay rent in school, um, it just seems, it's just hard. Like you just had to pay rent you don't get anything. So I want to be on the other side of that. I want to be receiving the checks and in my mind, um, not doing anything in the background. Now that I own the homes, I knew, I know there's some back end stuff that you have to do, ma maintain the homes and whatnot, screen tenants. But, um, I, I just knew that there was something there, you know? Yeah. So tell me about your first real estate deal and what that looked like for you. Was that a home that you bought just as an investment or something for yourself Ooh. to live in? This is funny. Um, I almost forgot this story. This first real estate deal is amazing because it didn't go through. This was, I signed a con, a land contract, um, to buy a house in Holton Lake on that second year before I went fishing on that second year that I, the really bad one where I, uh, um, the transmission went out. Mm -hmm. Um, so I gave them a thousand dollars down. Um, I think the house was for fifty five thousand. I was going to pay seven percent interest for five years with a balloon. After that, it's a little two bed in one bath, and um, these numbers are horrible for the area and the amount of rent I could get for. And I know this now, but at the time I didn't know. And but I came back from fishing. I had no money, so I had to walk away from the deal, lose my thousand dollars. Um, but in hindsight, um, that's a, I'm really happy that that didn't work out. And why is that? Um, because it's a bad area. Um, there's no jobs. It's um, the amount of money you get for rent doesn't. It's not a good ROI. Mm -hmm. You know things like that. Okay, so what was the first deal that did go through then? That was the house I live in right now, where I'm sitting right now. This was. So I put real estate on hold for a while, and, and I decided I want to go traveling, do some things. I went on a, a five-month uh, motorcycle ride from Africa to Norway. Um, just want to see the world. And then I came back. Now I'm ready to chill, have a place to live. So I was looking for real estate in Lansing, Michigan, um, learning about the market, figuring out what rents are, things like that. And I find a house that's for sale, um, it's an auction, and it's $25,000, and I look at it with the realtor, um, and I like it, and um, so I start bidding on it, and I'm watching the bids go, and it's slowly creeping up, and the auction's going to end in a couple hours, um, but the bid's already up to like 33, 34, it's, now it's at 35000 and they have a buy it now at forty. And and I'm like in the grand scheme of things, I could save, try to save a thousand or two, but maybe lose the deal. So I just did buy it now, mm -hmm. and uh, and I have the house, and I absolutely love it. Awesome. And was that a, a you have to do cash for auction, or were you able to finance that? That was a cash deal because yeah. I had the Alaska money coming in pretty steady at that point. Right. So I had some money in the bank. Um, kind of jumping around here, but again, I don't have any questions prepared here or anything. Um, right. How many summers now have you done the fishing in Alaska? Okay, so I've been. I just finished my um, 11th season as a captain, and that would be 13 years total. So I, I just turned 32 years old. Okay, got it. Um, so out of these years, what's been the most profit you've been able to take home, like after paying for everything and, and paying your crew and stuff? Okay, that was about two years ago. We got a dollar fifty a pound, and about close to hundred thousand is what I got. So you took home a hundred thousand dollars after five weeks. Yeah, now you got to pay tax on that, so right. that you're going to take about thirty uh, percent off that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, wow, that, that's incredible, man. And so at this point, uh, over the last you know X amount of years, have you been working uh, in the off season at all, or do you use that money um, f just from those five weeks to fund the rest of your year? Oh uh, yeah, I haven't been. I haven't had a W two job since since the pizza job in college. I've been fully self employed and going for it. So that's awesome, man. <laughs> if anybody was watching this right now, they would see a big smile on my face. I think that's so sick, and, and I think so many people out there, you know, when they hear I work five weeks a year and I make you know seventy grand a year and I just travel and do real estate the rest of the year, I think so many people would just look at that and be like, "You lucky son of a bitch!" Like that's so awesome. Like I want that, you know. But when they hear you had to put five years of crazy work into this before it ever paid off and like, you know, how much you sacrificed and, and just busted your ass to make it work, that's the part they don't see, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's cool to be able to share this story now. Um, so after that first real estate deal, um, what got you into the mindset of, you know, you wanted to keep doing deals and, and renovating them yourself and, and being a landlord and stuff? Um, well, I'll get to that in a second. I just, I just want to remind everyone, um, it's not always great. And I, I want to point out that 
Um, I, I'm coming from a very humble place right now. This last year, I just got back from Alaska a week ago, and that was the worst year I've had in the in the 13 years. I mean, even my first year when I made $100, I I still owe my company that I fished for money. Hmm. I would have um, done better if I didn't go up there, and that's because I reinvested. I um, bought a new fishing boat, had to put a lot of money into it, um, and then the price substantially collapsed this year. Last year we got paid a dollar twenty a pound. This year we got paid fifty cents, hmm. um, and I still caught the same amount of fish. It's just um, fishing is an extremely it's ups and downs. Okay, and I had and I bought in low. And it slowly went up, and I till that year where I made you know the hundred thousand dollars, and then, um, then it just crashed. It went right down. So it's not, it's not always good. Which is why the real estate thing, um, you know, I wanted a place to invest my money because you can't count on fishing every year, mm -hmm. and this is a perfect example of of this year. Right. So even though you owe money this year. Uh, because you bought the new boat, is that sort of still kind of like a, a long-term strategy? Like, you know, you're down this year, but because of the new boat, hopefully you'll do better next year kind of thing? Uh, yes, yes. But, I mean, I was so disgusted by this year, the boat's for sale. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you look online, you can see it. And if it sells, I'm happy. And if it, if I can't get what I need to get out of it, then I'll try to lease it. And if I can't lease it, then I'll be back up there for the for the 14th year. Okay, interesting. So if it does sell and uh, and you don't go back up, what's the plan now going forward for uh, for your income? Are you just changing your lifestyle up and going to get a, a regular type of job? or? Nope, um, full full steam ahead with the real estate. For okay, sure. cool. I, the last couple of years, I've, I discovered a website called Bigger Pockets. I've been listening to their podcasts. I'm talking with more investors. I've been taking real estate a lot more seriously in the last couple of years now that I'm learning about it really seeing the true potential i mean with fishing that's fishing you're limited you have one boat it's a certain size you get two guys you can catch so many fish that's all you can do mm -hmm. real estate it's it makes fishing pale in comparison yeah got it um so just a heads up for anybody listening um i actually interviewed the ceo and founder of biggerpockets.com on this show you can listen to that it's episode number 25 his name is joshua dorkin um, and he gave some really good insight into real estate investing as well. Um, so now that you're on that website and kind of talking with investors in that community and stuff, what does your real estate portfolio look like these days? Um, well, I just um, finished buying. Well, I, I signed a purchase agreement, uh, what was it, three days ago for my ninth single family home. So that's what I focus on here in Lansing. Um, two bedroom, one bath is mainly what I have. So nine of them. Cool. And uh, are all of those cash deals as well, or do you have financing on some? No. Those, um, I'm learning about the power of leveraging. My first house that was a cash deal, and that was okay because I was living in it, and I wasn't getting income coming in, okay? Right. Um, but then they've been financed after that, and so now I'm up to like, I have three free and clear, and then the rest are um, financed. Okay, cool. So, as you're building up the portfolio, so the, the problem that I run into is that because I uh, don't have a W-2 job with steady income, um, I'm ha having a hard time getting financing on any more properties, even though yeah. you know I've, I've got four places now, one of them's paid off, and the rest I've never had a late payment on. I've never you know, been late on a credit card. My credit score is over 800. Like, everything on paper is great, except for my yearly income because of this lack of job situation. Um, so how are you working your way around that and being, being able to get financing? Yeah, I totally understand where you're coming from. Um, it's a fishing job. So um, when I do my Schedule C, um, my debt-to-income ratio is acceptable, acceptable for the loans. Now, the first four were easy to get. Um, because what mortgage companies do is they, they give you a mortgage and then they resell that mortgage to uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, they have tight requirements that put you in this box. So if you want that fifth mortgage, um, that's not going to be able to be sold to those companies. So the requirements um, can be harder to, to have, okay? Mm -hmm. So all that takes is... Um, it's a very niche product, and if you look around, do searches, talk to um, investors, you may come across, as I did, um, a mortgage broker who has companies that will lend you, um, get you fixed rate interest, uh, fixed rate mortgages on up to ten properties. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the direction I'm going right now. Gotcha. So, so are, is what you're saying, just so I'm clear on what you're saying, um, you're having to work with more independent brokers as opposed to some of the bigger banks. Is that what you're saying? 
Absolutely. You got to be down. Yeah. The bigger banks, you might not even, you might as well not even talk to them after four, four loans. Got so. it. Okay, cool. Um, so tell me, um, maybe a success story and a not so success story on any of your properties. Okay. Uh, this will be fun. Let's see. Um, I don't, I'll just do my house I live in because that's both, okay? So I, I bought my house and then I had this grand scheme. I'm going to remodel the um, kitchen um, and that took three years. I started it and I knocked on the wall. Um, I, I started having some friends w- live with me. I was getting lazy. And what I learned in this process is to never, for me, never try to remodel a house that you live in, okay? Keep them separate. Even It's even better just to rent a place and, and remodel in six months and then and then move in. So because you can't cook, you can't you can't do anything. Um, but after the three years, it turned into a success story. I finally got that finished. I turned the upstairs into a duplex. Um, so now I rent that up top for five fifty a month, and then I'll have one roommate with me downstairs um, for like four seventy five. And on a free and clear home, that's really I'm living for free. So I've created this. Not only I'm living for free, they're paying my taxes. Um, my insurance, and then on top of that, I make a couple hundred bucks a month, and I have a cool pad to live in, you know? Yeah, yeah, that, that's <laughs> so, great. Um, so you are your own landlord. You don't have anybody managing the properties for you. Um, yeah, correct. So tell me the process of uh, screening your tenants to make sure that you get the best tenants possible in there. Okay, so this is a learning. This is constantly a changing process. Um, I'm a huge <laughs> – now, any real estate investor will tell you this is dumb, what I'm about to say, but this is what I've done. I just trust my gut. It's only burned me twice so far. Um, I need to stop doing this. I need to follow my own advice and um, and have do credit checks. I don't do that. Um, proof of income. But what I do is – I mean, that's why I've lived my whole life is just handshakes and, and looking people in the eye. So when people come up to look at the house, first of all, it, I ask them to um, um, meet me in a certain time. If they're not there, then I don't even answer their phone call again, right? Things mm-hmm. like that. Um, and then you, so, but it needs, I need to tighten that up for sure. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. I mean, if it works for you, it works for you. And obviously, as things progress and get bigger, that could become more of a problem. Um, but if you're the one handling them all and, and you don't have a good gut feeling about it, then, then I think, you know, that makes sense to me. It totally makes sense. Um, so you travel, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, you, you did the fishing thing and then you do the real estate thing. But on top of that, you are a big time world traveler and just kind of adventure seeker and stuff, uh, which I know a lot of people out there are super fascinated with. And, and it's so cool when somebody, you know, kind of lives this dream that so many people think of, you know, of, you know, making money and then going off and traveling the world. And so many people think about it, but just never do that. Um, so when did you get bit by the travel bug and how did that kind of all start for you? Oh, that started my senior year of high school. I went to a really small private school. So there was 12 kids in my class. Oh, wow. and. Yeah, really small. Um, and so what we did was we raised money because we knew there's only 12 kids to send off on a senior trip. So we raised enough money to go to Paris, France for a week. Um, and that just blew my mind. You know, when you're 18 years old, um, you're out in, with all your classmates in Paris walking around, seeing the Eiffel Tower, there's catacombs there, um, all the things to be seen in Paris. I, I just knew I wanted to travel some more. Very cool. So at this point, how many, you said you're 32, right? Yeah. Uh, how many countries have you been to now? Uh, I, it's like 40. I'd have to do an exact. And then there's the countries like the Vatican. Do you count that? And, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Got it. Um, so how, uh, aside from, you know, having free time due to your job or, or lack of job during most of the year, um, people ask me all the time kind of how I make it, how I make it work. Um, so what is your answer for that when people say like, how do you do this? Like, is it that you do things for cheap and you just kind of pinch pennies along the way? Are you really creative with frequent flyer miles? Um, do you go someplace and, and kind of work to be able to stay for free or do you just simply make money during the other times of the year and spend that money on your trips? Well, you actually, everything you just mentioned I've done at certain points in my life, it's, it's just constant learning and changing and tweaking your method and right now i'm huge on the credit card miles because i understand that and i have a friend that's he's really good with that so i mean for example i'm going to romania for a week uh in the 21st in a couple days here 
and that airplane ticket is free from the miles. Yeah. You know, and and it's just, you know, you spend a lot of money in fishing, so you use it on your credit card, and then you get the miles, and it's it's one of those things. If you can get past this hump and be smart about your finances, things can grow and multiply quicker. But it's so hard to when you start at the bottom. Um, you know, collecting pop cans off the ground to even save a hundred dollars, and then once you have a hundred, you can turn it into two hundred. You know, yeah. it, you, there's a certain point where it's um, you got to get past, and then it gets easier. Yeah, um, can, give me an example of kind of a creative trip that you've taken, um, either by using frequent flyer miles or or just you know going an unconventional route that wasn't just like dropping a couple grand on plane tickets and you know kind of the, the traditional of what people would think travel looks like. Okay. Um, this was two winters ago. I, I went to Hawaii and I made a bunch of friends. Um, I met a, I hooked up with a friend that I rode motorcycles with in Mexico and I met a guy that owned a dirt bike touring company, Maui Motors, Maui Moto Adventures. And I talked to him throughout the year and we, and I, and I asked him if I could be a dirt bike tour guide. And he said, yeah, cause I, I was pitching him myself. Come on, man, you, you want to take a month off, you've been working really hard, things like that. He's like, yeah, I have. So I talked my way into this job. So, I, so the next winter, I flew to Maui, and for one month, I lived in the shop, um, and I gave dirt bike tours um, like two, three times uh, um, on the weekend. I had the whole week to go to beaches and do whatever I want. And on top of that, my airplane ticket was um, through Alaska Air, so it was free miles to get there. And all, and I didn't make much money. He paid me like a hundred a tour, right? Mm-hmm. But, but that money paid for all my food throughout the week, and I slept in the shop for free on a couch. And there's a bathroom and a shower, and I'd change tires for him and do kind of stuff like that. So I had a free Hawaii vacation where I got to ride dirt bikes um, a couple times a week. That's awesome, man. That's a creative little way to sneak yourself in some fun, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm going to quickly share one of mine because uh, <laughs> even just this past weekend, actually, somebody asked me, you know, how do you do that? Um, so uh, this past January, J- January 2015, I spent the whole month in Asia. Uh, I did about a week in Singapore, uh, Malaysia, Bali, and then Thailand. And before that, I was in Louisiana for a week. Uh, and people say, you know, how do you do it? So for me, this is what it looked like. I got a, uh, I had taken a flight on Southwest Airlines at one point and they offered, you know, we oversold the flight. We're going to offer somebody a travel voucher of, I think, 100 bucks or 150 bucks if you'll bump a flight and take the next flight that leaves in like two hours from now. So I did that. So I had a travel voucher on Southwest Airlines. So I used the travel voucher to get a one way flight from LA to Louisiana to go see my family for Thanksgiving. Um, so after the travel voucher, I owed, I don't know, 50 or 80 bucks, you know. So I got to Louisiana for like $80, let's say. From there, I used frequent flyer miles on United Airlines, which I had accumulated through my credit cards and through other flying trips and stuff that you know companies sent me on that I didn't pay for. I got a, a one-way frequent flyer mile trip from Louisiana to Singapore. Uh, in Singapore, uh, the reason I went there is because my stepsister's husband has like a work assignment there for 18 months, so they're living there. So in Singapore, I had somebody to pick me up from the airport. You know, I didn't have to get a rental car or anything, and I had a very nice place to stay for about a week. Um, then from there, it was, I think, a $30 bus ride or so, um, 30 40 bucks to get from Singapore to Malaysia. So I did that and then stayed in a hostel that was like a t- maybe $20 a night or so hostel. Um, and then I took off for a couple of days and like went and stayed in the jungle on some kind of paid tour type of thing. Uh, and then I just took the, the train and monorail or whatever all around Malaysia while I was there. Um, from there... On Air Asia, I found like a quote unquote domestic flight because uh, in Asia, like, you know, the countries are so close to each other. It's not like in the US, we have to cross the pond. So from Malaysia to Bali on Air Asia, it was like an $80 flight. Uh, and that was just how cheap it was naturally, you know? So I got to Bali for, um, you know, 80 bucks or whatever, just spent the money on a cab to get to where I wanted to go, rented mopeds for $5 a day. Um, my, I, I know at one point I splurged quote unquote on a, on a hotel type of thing that had a really dope infinity pool. It was like this giant room, super nice room. Um, literally you walk out the back door and you can walk into the ocean and it was like the most gorgeous snorkeling I've ever seen. Um, and that was my splurging. It was like $30 a night. I did that for maybe three nights, you know, before I was like, okay, I'm spending too much money on a hotel now. Then, yeah. uh, you know, I got a cab to a different city, um, and paid probably 10 or 12 bucks a night for the hostel there for the rest of the week. Um, from there, it was only because, again, it was like, quote, unquote, domestic from uh, Bali to Thailand. It was only, I don't know, like 12,000 or 17,000 frequent flyer miles to get there. So I went there on frequent flyer miles. So that one, you know, after taxes, cost me $5 or whatever. 
Stayed in Thailand, uh, again, you know, 10 to 13 bucks or whatever for the bungalow for the night, uh, for the week that I was there. And then from Thailand back to LA, uh, got that on frequent flyer miles. So if you are creative with the use of your miles, and once you're over there, if you have the time to stay there longer, you can hop around for cheaper once you're there and stuff. And of course, you know, the types of places that you and I go, a lot of times it's really, really cheap to, to stay in the places, whether it be these bungalows or finding people to crash with and things like that. Um, so... That's just a story for the listeners to understand like how you can travel for a little bit cheaper and you know you can sort of live this free and you know lavish luxurious lifestyle without having to have that rich and that that wealth you know so early on and to be honest with you dude I want to live that kind of lifestyle. Like I want the more money. I want to travel a little bit more lavishly and that's kind of where I'm at at this point in my life as far as you know I want to increase my income so that I can increase the type of traveling that I do. Because I did that type of traveling that I just described to you, you know, for seven years. Like, you know, I worked at Ride BMX Magazine, and then after that, it's been over three years now that I haven't worked there. And so for, you know, these eight years, I've been traveling anywhere from like 100 to 200 days out of the year. Um, but a lot of it's been that penny pinching type of traveling, which has been amazing. But it's also got me like, you know, kind of satisfied to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm good for now. But also it's given me a taste for like what more there could be. You know, just like I was in college traveling around with my BMX friends and, you know, I would go to Texas and think this is great, but I knew that there was more out in California. And then I got to California and I was like, oh, there's more across the ocean, you know? And so now that I've done all these types of travels, I'm like, oh, there's more than just the moped. And there's more than just this little, you know, $30 a, a night splurge. There's, you know, the $3,000 a night thing in, Mal in the Maldives and Bora Bora and Tahiti and stuff, you know? And so everything that I've done has just been like, you know, pushing me to do that much more. Um, so while you can do it, I'm at the place where I'm like kind of not totally finished because I'm sure I'll still do it some, but I'm at a place where I want the next step, you know? Sure. And that's fine. Um, and that's kind of how I was what I was talking about earlier with, uh, I don't care to be rich, but I don't want money to be a limiting factor, you know? And if, and if you're trying to do something that's not outlandish, you know, um, you know, it's okay to spend 80 bucks on a hotel in a, in a nice place. You know, you don't have to always go with the cheapest option. I, I want to be able to do that. Um, but I really have no problem doing the cheaper option. Yeah, you know? totally. Totally. Um, so let's share a few travel stories here. I know you've, uh, Got lots of stuff. I don't even know where to begin. Um, for one, one that sticks out in my mind for some reason is Guatemala because I was there. Uh, I spent a month in Guatemala and Belize in January of 2014. And I remember being at a specific little place in Guatemala, like this little, you know, jungle, hostel, bungalow type place. And you commenting, saying like, oh, I stayed at that same place, you know. Um, so kind of a small world that we both ended up in the same place. Uh, so maybe you can tell me about uh, your Guatemala experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um well, the way I got to Guatemala was I rode a motorcycle from America to get there. Um, <laughs> Which is so, very different than how I got there, mind you. Again, I, I got there on frequent flyer miles, so a motorcycle drive all the way through Central or through Mexico and Central America is pretty yeah, hardcore. I think the year was 2009, and um, I was on this website called AdventureRider.com, ADDRider.com. I'm huge into the forums, and I was reading about other people's adventures, and I got the idea. I bought a motorcycle from a guy that was on the forums, um, and then I got uh, trailered to Corpus Christi, Texas, and then by myself, I was going to drive to Panama um, and have the whole winter, you know, six months or whatever. So I went all through Mexico in a month. I did both coasts, Mazatlan, Cancun, all the way down, Belize. Um, and then I got into Guatemala, and it just kept getting cheaper. Guatemala was cheaper. Um, the food was good. Uh, it's more jungly than Mexico, and I really liked it. And my favorite spot in Guatemala was the spot you were just talking about. And I think it's called El Rio or the Semic Canopy. I think that was... That's what it's called. But it's this cool spot you go to, and um, it's it's uh, state land, and there's a river, a really big river, river, and it goes underneath the ground, and then it shoots back up maybe three, 400 yards. Um, but on top, there's also water with these little pools that you can um, jump into, and that there's this 
um, this cave that you can take a tour through, or, through, and they give you these little candles instead of headlamps. They give you a candle, and you follow the guide, and you're swimming through this cave and climbing through this cave, holding this candle, and, and then you, you make friends, and everyone's putting each other's candles out, and you got to relight them, and it's, la- it's just amazing. It's so cool to do, you know, to do things like that. Yeah, for sure. sure. Where, where do you think this sense of adventure comes from, Andy? Obviously, like you said, you've been to 40 countries. You've done all these crazy motorcycle rides. Like, what is it in your personality that drives you to do those kind of things? I, I don't know. Um, maybe it was growing up and being kind of confined. I didn't have – we lived on 40 acres, and the closest neighbor to us – um, my age was like a mile and a half away, and I'd have to ride my bike over there. Um, and I think it was – we didn't have cable TV this before internet, so I was always exploring in the woods. And um, But always just a little bored when I was a kid. I was always just kind of bored and like antsy. I had this feeling of antsy. I needed – and I wanted to do everything. If, if you invited me to go rock climbing or to go see a movie or – just to go to McDonald's, I wanted to go, mm-hmm. and because I just kind of felt trapped living um, not in a neighborhood and being able to run around the streets. and And I loved riding my bike, but we lived on a gravel road, and we had this a uh, flat, you know, twenty by twenty foot apron in front of our house of concrete where I'd try my flatland tricks on. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had two sisters; I had no brothers to play with, so I, I think that's where it came from. Like all this built up like anxiety to just go have fun yeah so nowadays that you have traveled so much do you feel that antsiness when you're at home for two three four weeks like how long can you be home before you feel like oh my god i have to go somewhere and do something uh i'm pretty chill now (laughs) i got a hammock in my front porch and i just like to hang out that i definitely don't have that burning desire um to to do at least do trips by myself i love doing trips um i try to do one new country every year that's one of my goals um but the trips now are more about um, the friends I'm with mm-hmm. and like, like being a guide and a leader from all my experience and show and giving all this, uh, newness and excitement that I've seen myself and opening people's uh, minds and showing them what's out there. That's where I get the most excited. So I'm starting to go to this countries I've already been to just to show, uh, my friends like what's there and how awesome it is. Man, I got to tell you, I fucking love that answer. I think that's so cool. And, and I can relate to that a lot because, Um, as I said, I spent January in Asia for a month and I remember sitting in Thailand at one of my, what I could say, probably one of my favorite five places I've ever been in my life. There's this little lookout point on this small secluded beach that I've been to. It was the second time I went there actually. And I I liked it so much that I went back a second time and here I am in one of the most gorgeous places on earth. Um, you know, I just spent the day like kayaking in the ocean and rock climbing, and I'm, I'm up on this perch looking out, watching these long tail boats. It's sunset. It's gorgeous. It's amazing. But I feel this like emptiness inside me of like, this is great, but I'm alone. You know what I mean? And, and I'm sure I met cool people that day, and I, I hung out with the people that I rock climbed with, and, and I chatted with some people at the dinner table when I was at, you know, eating dinner. Um, but there was definitely this like emptiness about it. And, and I feel like maybe even a little bit before that, I just decided, you know what, I'm done. Like, I've done 35 countries at this point. I've done a lot of cool shit. Like, on, on paper, you know, it, it looks amazing. And it is amazing, you know, like whitewater rafting in, in Ecuador and, you know, re- repelling down waterfalls and scuba diving at the Great Barrier Reef and swimming with sharks in Africa, all this crazy shit that I've done. But I hit the point where I'm like, you know what, I'm good for now. Like, until I can find the right people to experience this kind of stuff with, I think I'm just going to stop. Um, so I, I can totally re- relate to that. And the fact that you're like trying to pass along that, that, uh, experience that you have with other people and, and kind of be that leader, man, I think that's really fucking cool. Right on. So I don't, like I said, I don't have any other questions here. Um, we, we were totally just free forming this. Um, we are about 46 minutes in. I usually record for about an hour. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to kind of talk about? Any other topics that you want to ask me about or that you just want to kind of get out there and, and tell some listeners about or anything? Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll share an experience um, similar to what you're talking about. I, my biggest trip I've ever done was um, for five months. Um, I, shipped a, I shipped a motorcycle over to South Africa with my best friend, Nick. And he brought a motorcycle over, and we. The plan was to ride unsupported from the lowest point in Africa, Cape Agulhas, to the northernmost point in Europe, um, Nordcap. So, so we did that, 
And it, it was amazing. We did every, I mean, we did all the things you're talking about, the shark diving. We climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. We met our friend Timmer there. We, um, um, we had all these adventures. I got some stuff stolen from me. We're camping out in Kenya. We see all the animals. It's amazing, right? It's like the best trip you can have. And we get eventually to London, and we're staying at this guy's house. And, and I have uh, my bike's in bad shape. We're trying to fix my bike up. Um, and we have the day off. And we fix my bike. We can do whatever we want. And we're like 45 minutes away from London, like a train ride. And, and we're like, you know, we got to go see London. But we're, but we're not excited. We've seen, like, we had um, vacation overload. And it, the vacation has now turned into the occupation. So, like, we were blogging the entire time and making videos and photos. And, like, we just wanted a break. We wanted tea and crumpets. But... Out of obligation, we um, went into London, and then we, I remember we were right next to Big Ben sitting on the bridge, and we're looking at all the tourists, and we're just sitting down like homeless guys, um, we're exhausted, and, and everyone's smiling and happy and taking photos and all these things, and we're like, I feel guilty that I'm wasting this experience, and everyone is so happy, and like, okay, we did too much, um, it's time to go home, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so but, but you, you trudged on and still made it up, right? What's that? But you trudged on, and, and even though you were exhausted, you still made it to the yeah. rest of the trip. We had to finish it. Yeah, so we went all the way up there, took the pictures, the whole deal, and finished the blog. Yeah, you got to finish uh, your tasks and your goals that you do. Right. But um, the point, like, I don't even know what the point is. Um, everything in moderation, you yeah. know? Like, we were extreme traveling, and I'm not going to be that guy that travels around the world forever. Um, I like, I like short little bursts and, and I was missing my friends. Nick was missing his friends and, um, yeah, you can't, yeah, you gotta do everything in moderation. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And you know, you, you said you don't know the point of that story. I guess the point of that story is, uh, just sharing real world experiences. You know what I mean? Like, like I said, so few people do the kind of stuff that you do and it seems so fairy tale to so many people. And it is like, obviously you're not taking it for granted and neither am I, um, but it, it's definitely an interesting perspective to hear it directly from the, the mouth of somebody that's actually done it and been there. Um, so hopefully the, uh, the listeners have gotten some cool stuff out of this by way of uh, deep sea, uh, you know, cold water fishing and, and real estate investing and traveling and stuff. Um, but I will go ahead and do the same thing that I do with all of my guests. I have a, a couple of quick hits that I like to ask people, kind of rapid fire questions that I'll just uh, run you through as well. Um, so uh, this question, it almost seems like it shouldn't, be asked to you because most of the people that I, I talk to have kind of, you know, 50 businesses going on and they've got families and this, that, and the other, and they're, uh, they're pretty hectic lives. Um, but the question is, how do you decompress? Oh, um, my hammock and <laughs> I sit on the front porch and I do like my alone time. I love, I'm very social, but, um, I just sit on my hammock and I people watch from my front porch and, um, I'll get on the internet and look up, uh, Volkswagen diesel cars and you know I love my forums I love I can't turn my brain off I listen to podcasts um I'm huge on star talk right now I like learning about science and um I just the way I decompress is not answering questions and just being by myself Got and it. Uh, Got learning cool um so you mentioned podcasts and stuff do you also read it all I don't read much. I used to read books a little bit, but podcasts, that's the way to go. Cool. Sure. I'll go ahead and share this real quick, just completely random, since this is a kind of random episode anyway. Um, you know, I used to try to read a lot, and uh, I did a lot of self-help books and real estate-type books and stuff. And at a certain point, for some reason, I just couldn't make myself read anymore. Like, anytime I picked up a book, I couldn't focus, and, and I just didn't know what it was. So then I switched to the audio books and the podcasts and stuff. Uh, and last weekend, or, or this past week, uh, my old roommates from college, they were in a band, and uh, they were actually doing a 10-year reunion tour for, for their first uh, like major album release or whatever, and I went to see him, and one of the, uh, the band members, the drummer Aaron Lunsford, he had released a book, uh, published a book, written a book, whatever you want to call it, uh, that was called Backstage, How I Almost Made a Million Dollars Playing the Drums in a Christian Hardcore Band. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, he, like I said, he was a roommate of mine in college. I had gone on tour with them uh, when they very first started the band. Um, and so, of course, I was excited to see this book. You know, a friend of mine wrote a book that's pretty cool. So I bought the book from him. And that night I read, you know, the first two chapters or whatever. And right away I was like so into it. And like I said, I hadn't read a book. It's probably three years. 
And uh, then the next morning I got up and I just kind of sat in quiet. I was on the floor just kind of hanging out with my dog. And I read a handful more chapters. And before you know it, I'm like halfway through the book. And I finished the book in less than 48 hours, which by far the fastest I've ever read a, read a book. Like, I mean, usually I'm a pretty slow reader and it'll take me two weeks to read a book minimum, you know, sometimes longer. Um, but there was something that was so refreshing about just sitting in quiet and not having the, you know, the voices from the podcast and the audiobooks and everything. Uh, and maybe it was just because the book was so personal because it was about a time in my life that, you know, I could really, you know, have fun reminiscing about it. And it was cool to see somebody else's perspective on everything that was going on at that time in my life. Um, but, uh, and, and I don't know if this is going to um, revive my love for reading and get me, you know, on the book train again, but, uh, but it was really cool and, and it was a good way for me to decompress almost, you know, just getting back to that old school, just sit in quiet time. Um, so anyways, random story that I uh, just wanted to bring up. Um, so next question in my list of quick hits is if there was a movie made about your life, what would be the obstacle or a hardship that you ever had that you had to overcome in order to achieve your success? And maybe that was what we already talked about of five years of struggling before the, uh, the fishing took off, but could be that there's something else that we didn't uh, cover in the interview already. Yeah, that's definitely, um, it would be focused on fishing. <clears throat> there's yeah. been so many days up there, even this year, this is my 11th year as a captain and, um, you just get frustrated and I need my fishing friends I've developed up there to talk me off the cliff is what they call it. Um, you just go nuts. It's, it's too competitive. Um, it's greedy. It's pretty ugly and disgusting, which is why I'm trying to transfer out of it. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, that's, that's it. That's the fishing really, uh, is taxing on me mentally for sure. Got it. Um, have you had any mentors throughout your life? And this could be, you know, through BMX or, or real estate investing or the fishing or traveling, anything else? Yeah, for sure. I had. Uh, I think everyone needs a mentor, and I didn't know that at the time, but when I was younger, I, probably 14 or 15, uh, this guy Bill Wilkie at my parents' church, he um, sought me out and, and saw something special in me and um, taught me how to water ski, and, and we started having uh, like coffee meetings together and, and asked me how I want to see my future develop. And um, he, he made me think what I was going to do in college, and he made me... Um, just think about the future and, and, um, he made me decide that the, what I wanted out of, uh, life was, um, some flexibility and, um, uh, discretionary income is the term. So I, I didn't need to be rich, but I wanted enough money and, and then I needed, um, the flexibility to use it, the time. Yeah. So that was really cool that, um, I learned that early, you know, a lot of people will never learn that. And, and, and if they do learn it, they learn it later in life. And I had that mentor to, to help me when I was young. That's really, incredible, man. How old were you, do you think, when you kind of realized I think that? I started when I was like 14 or 15. Wow, yeah, that, that's amazing. Um, that, that's definitely something that I have since learned. You know, I, I didn't learn it that early, but I think that's super important for people to know that about themselves and to figure out, um, you know, what I would call their, their lifestyle design, like how they want to design their life to, to best suit them. And uh, each year... I write out a list of goals, but then at the bottom of my list of goals, I also have paragraphs written of that kind of starts out like a balanced life for me is blank, blank, blank. And I, I write out exactly how I want my life to look. And if at any point I feel like I'm, I'm off track, I can kind of look back at that paragraph or, or those several paragraphs and say like, is what I'm doing today getting me towards that life that I wrote on paper that I want my life to be like? If not, what can I do to change that? Or do I need to change the paragraph because it has my, you know, goals and everything shifted, you know? Right. Um, so when do you feel like you get hit by inspiration or ideas the most? Podcasts. So that's what, that's what does it for me um, anymore. And, and you got to surround your, yourself around people that are like-minded and want to do what you're doing. And, um, and that's, that's the key for a lot of things. If you want to own a house, talk to someone that owns a house. If you want to start a podcast, talk to someone to start a podcast. It's all out there. And most and most of the time, these people want to help you because they remember how hard it was for them to start, them to struggle. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Seek out the people that know what you're trying to figure out. It's a shortcut. Totally, totally. Um, real quick before I forget, what was the, the name of the couple of the podcasts that you like besides the bigger pocket ones? Oh, Star Talks, Freakin Freakonomics, um, uh, Planet Money, that's my go-tos. Uh, so I will link those in the show notes. So everybody can go check those out as well. Um, shout out to the other people doing podcasts out there. Um, 
Finally, last but certainly not least, do you have a favorite quote or maybe a favorite piece of advice that you've uh, been given or, or any kind of words that you live by? Um, well, as a joke, I will give you my own quote. Uh, life is 75% mental. And, and there's probably some guys out there that are laugh about that. But I don't know. There's some truth to it. I mean, it's, it's life is in your head. So uh, use your brain. Cool, cool. Um, well, that we're going to wrap it up right there. Uh, thanks for, for jumping on here with such short notice. Thanks for reaching out to me this after, or yesterday and this afternoon as well. Um, do you want to go ahead and plug your social networks or anywhere else that you want people to connect to you through? Um, yeah, sure. Instagram, Luke Swab at uh, Instagram. Um, let's see. I got LukeAndNick.com. That is uh, my Africa blog. It's pretty cool. Videos, the whole pretty much we up- uploaded stuff every other day. Um, and then I guess I can tell you that I was on a TV show from Animal Planet last year, and you can look up on YouTube and watch the full episodes there. So that was me and five other boats. They followed us. So if you're interested in the fishing thing, watch that. That's called Alaska Battle on the Bay. That was Animal Planet. Cool. Was that an entire series that, uh, that featured you? Yep. Yep, that was one season, and uh, we didn't get a contract for season two. I wasn't funny enough. So. <laughs> Oh, oh, well. <laughs> All right, cool. We'll check that out, and uh, we'll link that in the show notes as well. And to find the show notes, of course, you guys can go to theexpansionprojectpodcast.com. And uh, while you're there checking out the show notes, be sure to click on the affiliate links on the right side of the page. We've got uh, lots of cool stuff. We've got Chef Kate's Nut Butter with the discount code. Also, Amazon. Of course, everybody buys stuff from there. So click through the Amazon banner on the show's website, and you will help out the show. And last but not least, we've got Nutrisuma, and that is uh, Nutrisuma.com. Use the promo code FATTONY1 for 20% off all of your protein and supplements. Uh, Of course, you guys can follow me on Instagram and all my social networks at FATTONYBMX. And, of course, of course, of course, my new project that I'm so excited about, I want you guys uh, to check out BreakParallel.com. It is a functional fitness slash CrossFit slash calisthenics grid, whatever you want to call it, uh, blog. What we do is we pull all the coolest content from all the sources that we can find online. So if you guys are looking for videos from your favorite companies or athletes or photo galleries of hot fitness chicks or just random fitspiration, um, or if you're looking for all the news in the functional fitness community, it is all there in one place, and I'm super excited to watch this thing grow. So bookmark that and tell your friends about it. It's called BreakParallel.com. And until next time, thank you guys for joining us. And again, Luke, thank you for this time. It's been a pleasure, and keep in touch, man. Cool, yeah, thanks for the interview with Fat. That's nice. That's fun. All right, buddy. Take care. See ya. All right. Bye.